Professor Mary Hickman. My good afternoon. Uh, yeah, I'd like to begin also by thanking Marion Casey and Kuma Kamali for the invitations uh, for this weekend. Uh, it's a real uh, pleasure to participate in anything to do with the 20th anniversary of Irish Studies and Ireland House at NYU. Uh, I'd also like to thank the uh, panelists and uh, keynote speaker this morning, because I found a few questions that have been rocking around in my head for a while, trying to read about uh, immigration history in 19th century America and history of the Catholic Church. I got answers this morning, which was a, a delight. So I'm taking a different tack. Marion invited me to um, talk about what the case uh, reading the transcript, suggested to me in the context of Britain. And that's really my area of expertise. And I'm not approaching this as a legal scholar, but as a sociologist who's interested in the simultaneous processes of incorporation and differentiation that characterize national formation and indeed national reformations of Western societies, and especially as these are manifest in relation to immigrants, their descendants, and their social and cultural practices. Critics of uh, immigration um, often are expressing fear, or they, they feared, or fears of difference posed by immigrants and often by their religions. And in fact, religion is often a, a frequent catalyst for expressions of prejudice and hostility and of practices of intolerance towards those constituted as minorities. And what I really want to say is that there is, after all, no link between guarantees of religious freedom and tolerance. And to understand that there is no automatic link between them, we have to really surrender an understanding of tolerance as a transcendent or universal concept or tolerance as virtue and consider it as a political discourse and practice of governmentality. And I'll try and explain what I mean by that in the course of the paper. And following Wendy Brown, I want to argue that tolerance is about the management of the threat represented by difference. It is a singular form of such management insofar as it involves the simultaneous incorporation and maintenance of the otherness of the tolerated element. This distinguishes tolerance from assimilation of immigrants or rejection of immigrants or minorities. You know, I, those two words aren't interchangeable, but I would use both. It is, of course, important to make a distinction between a personal ethic of tolerance, an ethic that issues from an individual commitment and has objects that are largely individualized, and a political discourse, a regime or governmentality of tolerance that involves a particular mode of depoliticizing and organizing the social. It's the latter I'm discussing today. And I would argue tolerance in this sense constitutes a, a very dominant contemporary discourse in Western liberal democratic states. One of the pitfalls of diversity has been taken to be that it fosters intolerance, although this, of course, ignores how processes of national formation, Americanization, or processes of becoming British sacrifice tolerance for a unified identity. What has been controversial about multiculturalism in the contemporary period is that it is taken to be about preserving group distinctiveness and loyalty. This is the obverse of the assimilationist principle, assumed until about the last 30 or 40 years or so to be the rational aim in discussions of immigration, although it's also often disguised in discusses, discussions of policies of integration, which I don't think ama differ amazingly with assimilation. Although not all countries have the kind of formal legal separation of church and state that characterizes the United States and France, an informal de facto separation is almost a commonplace. 
again, I'm referring to Western de liberal democracies, so, you know, societies that perceive themselves as Western liberal democracies. England, for example, or England and Wales, I should use the actual legal entity name of, is strictly speaking a religious state with secular politics, but many commentators view it as an example of a state where the religiousness of the state is an empty symbol rather than a compelling commitment. What do these legal regimes represent? Or is the critical factor the ways in which nation states deal with religious diversity and how they, the dominant culture, perceive themselves? Nations are often formally committed to religious neutrality, while their cultures, including political cultures, are infused with the values and habitats of the dominant religion, which occupies a privileged cultural space. Samuel P. Huntington, and I have to confess to you, I never thought I'd ever quote this man vaguely favorably, but <laughs> because his thesis in his book, Clash of Civilizations, on the relevance of tolerance to deal with that clash is the exact opposite of what I'm saying today. But nevertheless, all, 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 anyone who writes a book, there's normally at least one kernel in it that's worth it. Um, Sam, Samuel P. Huntington states that although some people argue that the absence of religious, of, of religious language in the US Constitution and the provisions of the First Amendment are evidence that America is a fundamentally secular country, that nothing could be further from the truth. Whether one agrees with him or not, his point that the framers of the American Constitution prohibited an established <coughs> national church in order to limit the power of government and to protect and strengthen religion is interesting. On this reading, the separation of church and state, of religion and society, was not to establish freedom from religion, but to establish freedom for religion. Religious diversity has consequently flourished. In England and Wales, in the realm of law, the Church of England is, is the established church, and Roman Catholics are the only grouping ineligible to have a member of their denomination to be head of state. Although constantly we're told this may be changed, but that those uh, suggestions have been going on for about 20 or 30 years now. Nor has any Catholic ever been prime minister in the modern era. This is a consequence of British history and the reverberations of cult cultural memories of that history. For example, I'm going to, I know I should mostly be talking about the 20th century, but we're going to have a quick trip back to the 17th. For example, the events celebrated every year in Britain on what's called Guy Fawkes Day or Bonfire Night on November the 5th tell us quite a bit about British history. Upon his accession as King James I of England, after the death of Elizabeth I, English Catholics had hoped that this son of a Catholic, grandson of a French Catholic, would make, <clears throat> would make life better for Catholics than it had been under Elizabeth I. He promised them toleration if he was crowned king. However, James I broadly followed his predecessor's policies and did not <coughs> disturb arrangements in place. So five men, one of whom was Guy Fawkes, the person charged with lighting the gunpowder, laid a plan to blow up the Houses of Parliament and instigate a rising to protest the tyranny they felt Catholics had to endure. They chose the state opening of Parliament, which would mean when all the monarchy, all the House of Lords, all the House of Commons, all politicians would be gathered together in the same place, on the 5th of November, 1605, to do this. However, the plot was discovered. Fawkes was arrested and tortured, and three, he and three others were hung, drawn, and quartered early in the following year. Now, I believe you've all been given a quote by an, a lawyer called Clive Stafford Smith, which has been printed out, and I just want to make reference to that now. Clive Stafford Smith he's, is, the lawyer, is a lawyer who represents many of the people incarcerated in Guantanamo Bay. And in a lecture to the Haldane Society, a, a legal society in London in 2005, he compared the practices of the American government with substantial British collusion to, uh, in Guantanamo Bay 
and James I's handling of the aftermath of the gunpowder plot in 1605, especially in the use of torture. He argues that, <laughs> as, with, as with Guantanamo Bay today, their goal, that is the king and the privy council, who were obliged to issue a warrant before torture could be used, <coughs> their goal was not really to identify the plotters because the ringleaders had already been captured and killed within a few days. The goal was to get evidence against others whom the government suspected of involvement. In this, the rack was successful. That's an instrument of torture. I am sort of assuming you've all heard of that. Some of Guy Fawkes' colleagues cracked and fingered the Jesuit priests. The authorities naturally believed that the priests were the wrong leaders of any Catholic troublemaking. They were the imams of their day, in the eyes of the authorities, or Stafford's making the comparison to authorities now. Sadly, history teaches us that, the, as he goes on, sadly, history teaches us that the wretched priests were probably innocent. Their limited knowledge of the plot had been learned under the veil of the confessional and they had tried to steer Fawkes and his colleagues onto another course. Even though they were strong critics of Protestant intolerance, they knew then what the overwhelming majority of Muslims know now, that a violent plot by, by a few extremists would only lead to greater persecution against all members of their faith. But the priests were duly dispatched to the stake." End of quote. In 2005, as it was four months after the <coughs> bus and tube bombings in London that killed 52 people, there was considerable interest, more than usual, in the 400th anniversary of uh, the gunpowder plot. And much was made that it included the spectre of foreign inmans who were perceived as a global threat and involved the use of torture and the implementation of counter-terrorism measures. It's interesting, really, to note that religious divisions have far exceeded class divisions in generating violence in Britain. Not that you know this from many histories of Britain. To this day, the most serious urban riots in British history were the Gordon Riots of 1780. They took place in London and were prompted by the prospect of Parliament granting some relief to Catholics. 285 people were killed in the riots. The Reformation in England and Wales had been a highly politicized religious process. One result was that religion was bound to national formation for centuries to come. Political identities were created. To be, English, to be Anglican was to be English, to be, to be Protestant was to be British, and to be Roman Catholic was to be suspect. With large-scale Irish immigration in the 19th century, undoubtedly what happened in the aftermath of the Catholic Emancipation Act in 1929 was that there was actually an increase in hostility to Catholics and a conflation of their ethnicity and religion, and a conflation of ethnicity and religion in which Irish Catholics were often, and these were Irish Catholic immigrants coming over both before, during, and after the famine, were often labelled and treated as an internal enemy or other. This process was central, for example, to emerging policing practices in the 1830s, 40s, and 50s. A form of segregated incorporation was instituted in order to deal with Irish immigration, and it was one of the key reasons for the particular form of religiously-based state education which emerged in Britain. If we fast forward to the 20th century, we find that in the next largest phase of immigration, which was after the Second World War, uh, when Britain was reconstructing, reconstructing itself in the aftermath of the damage done by that war. This was a period of great uh, immigration from the Caribbean, the Indian subcontinent, and Ireland. And at that time, Britishness was reimagined, and it was a reimagining that did not include plurality. Nevertheless, there was an eventual acceptance by about the 1990s that, in particular, the mid-century coloured, in quote, migrants were in Britain to stay, and consequently, the many hundreds of thousands of new migrants or immigrants of the 1990s <coughs> and early 21st century have had to be um, uh, positioned and othered in a different way. 
and for this the concept of diversity is critical. Diversity is used as a signifier of difference of immigrants, of minority ethnic or minority religious groups. In other words, different, diversity is referring to a national community that includes others. Diver, diverse, I say this, and I'm quite critical of the term diversity, because it's always already speaking of a in quote host or core constituency that is being subject to diversification and reconstructs itself by identifying that difference. In this era, meaning now, a discourse of tolerance has become critical, and much of its focus is on culture, and for that term, often you can read religion. The incorporation of a language of tolerance into the contemporary ethos of cultural pluralism expresses a historical formation in which subjects are identified with and reduced to certain attributes or practices, which in turn are held to be generative of certain beliefs or consciousness. That's a very sociological way of saying that people are reduced in public perception to being carriers of a certain culture, and that's seen as inherent. Uh, some sociologists call it a form of cultural racism. I think it's, it, one has to be more specific than that. And, uh, but what it is certainly saying is that people aren't seen as whole, whole persons. They're seen as members of communities and, in, and as carriers of certain inherent characteristics. And so under the um, prevalence of such discourses, where advocacy of tolerance towards um, others <coughs> who are different reifies and exaggerates the otherness of a tolerated subject, we find that people who in the immediate aftermath of uh, the Second World War, um, during that period of immigration, were called Asian or Pakistani, have the, often the very same people are now just called Muslims, utterly regardless of whether, of course, they're Hindu, Sikh, Muslim, non-religious, Christian, whatever. Tolerance as a term of justice crucially sustains a status of outsidedness for those it manages by incorporating. It even sustains them as a potential danger to the civic or potential or political body. And I'm going to skip over what I was going to say about that, which was just to give some outline of a recent project I did comparing um, uh, the experiences of Irish people in Britain during the Northern Ireland Troubles of the 1970s, 80s, and 90s with those of Muslims in Britain now. And there were some very, very interesting, simi massive similarities in their experiences, but quite critical differences in how the two groups were perceived in Britain. But I'll skip that and go to my final points. In Britain, what uh, has really characterised this period of, uh, of the last 15 years of relative attack on uh, multiculturalism has been a renewed emphasis on the role of Britishness in achieving cohesion in a diverse society. In 2007, Tony Blair argued that core British values consist of tolerance, solidarity and equality. And uh, he summed it up as saying that um, being British meant the right to be different, the duty to be integrated. On another occasion, he said in, in what is an exemplar of intolerance and clarity, our tolerance is part of what makes Britain Britain. Conform or, do or don't come here. We don't want hate mongers, whatever their race, religion or creed. These definitions of British norms and values in terms of liberal democracy are, of course, also a nationalist practice because the certain groupings in the nation are assuming they could define it. So on my very last sentence, the, what I suppose I'm trying to draw is uh, this notion that religious freedom doesn't necessarily guarantee tolerance and that if we look historically, particularly at the moment in Britain, and I'm not going wider than that, although I think this discourse of tolerance is quite widely applicable in Western societies, that the experience of Irish Catholics and the conflation of their ethnicity and religion in 19th century Britain is very similar to what's happening to many Muslims today. 
and that Muslims find the right to build a mosque and gather there to pray is no, prote no more protection against it being attacked than was the right to build a Catholic church in the 19th century uh, and gather there to celebrate mass was the right, with, you know, no more did it guarantee that they wouldn't be subject to violent attack. Thank you. Mm.